you know, you have to put this in perspective in that this was prior to Jane Fonda making it popular for women to exercise and and actually sweat. I mean, that was a that was a big movement that didn't happen until like in the early 80s inside of Iowa. It was highly accepted. I mean, I could I could wear my makeup and put ribbons in my hair and go out and kick butt playing basketball and everybody thought it was cool. But outside of that, um, especially when you know, with the pro leagues, they were like, I'd go put my check in the bank, my professional check that I just got paid. And they go, basketball. They go, what do you do? I said, I'm a player. And they go, you don't look like a player. I said, really? What's a pro basketball player supposed to look like? Well, you're supposed to be, you know, look like a guy and be big and, you know, strong and everything. And I'm like, really? (laughs) Well, I would like to invite you out to see our games and then see what you have to say after that. You know, so there was the stereotype and this perception, I think, um, of of just society in general that we had to overcome and we were probably before our time just because the mentality of our society wasn't there yet. We were just a little too soon. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, gang, it's Tim Hanlon. How are you? Thank you for joining me on my little excursion into what used to be in professional sports. Uh, We call it Good Seats Still Available, and uh, we thank you for joining us. If it's your first time here, uh, we appreciate your giving us a chance to uh, fill your earbuds with some interesting stuff. And uh, if you're a return visitor, well, hopefully we uh, don't let you down uh, with uh, hopefully what is a uh, another fun episode. And I do believe it is one uh, a fun episode that is uh, because of our special guest. Her name is Molly Kazmer. And uh, if you don't remember the name, perhaps uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, if you remember properly, uh, the Women's Professional Basketball League or WBL, as it was known, uh, you may remember her in uh, when she was known as Machine Gun Molly Bolin, uh, the WBL's first ever signing, uh, its most prodigious scorer uh, on the court and uh, arguably the uh, sex symbol and uh, public relations phenom for the league that only lasted about three years or so, uh, but was uh, seminal in its uh, contributions to the beginnings of uh, the possibility of a sustained women's professional basketball circuit in the United States, which uh, I think we uh, all enjoy the benefits of today in in today's modern day WNBA, uh, who is, uh, which is in the middle of its uh, playoffs for this very season. So, uh, Molly Kazmer is our guest, and I, uh, I encourage you, even if you're not a fan of women's professional basketball, uh, uh, to listen because uh, she's just a fun and engaging personality. Uh, she's a, just a delight to talk to, and um, it's our first opportunity to kind of shine a spotlight on uh, the women's professional uh, basketball uh, game uh, and uh, the uh, the leagues and um, the people and the teams involved in in setting that uh, process up that we, again, enjoy today in today's modern day WNBA. Uh, That uh, conversation with Molly uh, coming up in uh, a couple of seconds. Uh, Let me just get through some promotional banter, of course, uh, before we do that. And uh, we encourage you again, if you haven't done so already, to please give our sponsor Audible a try. Why don't you? Uh, Audible, as you know, hopefully by now is the premier provider of digital audiobooks and uh, has over 180,000 titles to choose from. And again, our listeners can enjoy a sampling of what Audible has to offer by getting a free, free, yes, completely free, audiobook download, as well as a 30-day trial of the service, again, for free from Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats, and uh, it is there where you can sign up uh, and uh, and get uh, a taste uh, of your own free audiobook download from Audible's library of of more than 180,000 titles. And, and look, if you can't find a, an audiobook to listen to uh, from a catalog of over 180,000 titles, well, you might be on the wrong planet because Audible's got just about every genre you can imagine uh, in the audiobook format, whether that be a thriller or comedy or sci-fi or nonfiction or romance or business, it, you name it, you got to think there's got to be at least one title in, a, in that uh, gigantic uh, catalog uh, of choices. So please give it uh, a try. Why don't you? Uh, I love audiobooks. So they're just a tremendous way to kill time. Uh, if you're out in the, uh, you know, riding your bike or, or running, you know, your five mile, uh, you know, workout or, or uh, you're on a long drive and need something other than uh, talk radio to kind of keep you interested. Uh, an audible 
audiobook uh, is uh, is the way to go. Audibletrial.com slash good seats. That's the website. That's the place. Go give it a try. Again, a 30 day free trial of the Audible service and one free audiobook download for you to enjoy. You can cancel at any time. And Audible is awesome. Uh, give it a try and we appreciate you doing so. All right, let's not waste any more time. Let us get to our tremendous, fun, engaging, and just all in out delightful conversation uh, with the Women's Professional Basketball League pioneer, Molly Kazmer, here on The Big Show. As you probably know, uh, as I said in my emails, the, the conceit of this show, <clears throat> for whatever reason, is... Uh, some weird sort of fascination with uh, teams and leagues and and the stories, et cetera, of such that uh, are, are no longer with us for for various reasons. I I think actually it started when I was a kid in the '70s, watching uh, old North American soccer league games and becoming a soccer mm-hmm. fan and, and wondering why teams just disappeared like after every year or two. Um, but you know, I uh, uh, growing up clearly very conscious, uh, although I have to admit never went to an actual an actual game of. Uh, the women's professional basketball league, the WBL, um, and right. um, and I, I am fascinated and continue to be fascinated by uh, the stories and 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 frankly a whole bunch of pioneering efforts that uh, you as a player uh, in that era of the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, playing professional basketball as a woman um, with a league and a concept that was uh, new and and unproven, um, and and frankly what uh, the game. Uh, and the sport and uh, how uh, female athletes are perceived and uh, admired in today's society. I got to think that um, it was a, a heady time for you and, and, and your name constantly pops up in all the, all the material. So I want to, first of all, thank you for, for taking time. I, I guess the audience or my audience would be probably most interested, I guess, to start. How did you even get into the position of being able, being even able to consider uh, a professional career of sorts in in basketball? Well, I would have to say it starts with just the fact that I lived in Iowa and grew up in Iowa. Um, I, my parents were from there originally, but um, I attended the first couple of years of school in Phoenix, Arizona. And then after my grandpa, my grandma passed away, we moved back there to be with my grandpa. And we lived in um, one small town for a couple of years. And then when I was in fifth grade, we moved over to Moravia. And Moravia had a really great history of girls' high school basketball going there since the 1950s. They had a winning tradition that just seemed to continue. And, of course, in fifth grade, um, you know, I attended some of the girls' basketball games on the Friday night, the home games. And just the excitement, it's hard to describe, except it's just an event, you know, in a little town like that. The gym was packed. Um, the excitement in the air, you know, the pep band. Um, it was just such a cool thing. And then, of course, you know, I zeroed right in on the best player on the team and watched her play. And I was like, hmm, I want to do that because that was awesome. Yeah, clearly seemed to come natural to you, right? Uh, did Were you even amazed at, frankly, how, how good you were and so relatively quickly in your, your passion or interest of the game? Well, I didn't really see it that way because, you know, in in fifth and sixth grade, uh, we did have like a family fun night that we were um, played in front of a crowd. And that was something that, you know, I personally took kind of seriously and I practiced on my own. We didn't really have an organized team for that. In seventh and eighth grade in my little town, of course, Moravia is a town of 700 people. So it's a very small town. But in seventh and eighth grade, we had an organized junior high team that played, you know, we had uniforms, we had home and away games, we traveled in a bus, just like the high school did. So there weren't too many schools back in the early 70s that did that in the middle school, for sure. And then, of course, in high school, if you were a basketball player, um, it was a big thing because the town followed it, the newspapers followed it, the radios followed it, it was te- the state tournament was televised. Um, you know, the championship. I mean, it was just huge back there. But I didn't really feel like I got good that quick. What I did was I just played a lot of, you know, back then I'd play pickup games all summer. I'd play against the boys in the neighborhood. Um, You know, there was one boy that lived next door to me that was a year older that I used to play on a bent rim 
out in the snow and we used to battle one-on-one and when I'd beat him, he'd take my ball and heave it as hard as he could down the street. <laughs> so, you know, that was kind of one of the, the early times when I was just getting really competitive is that I always had to play somebody a lot better than me, you know, to, to push the limits a little bit. But when I was in eighth grade, um, the high school coach, uh, so, so I played the junior high team. Um, I was kind of known as a gunner then because I was just so determined to win. You know, I, I shot a lot of, I wasn't a very good shooter. I shot two hand overhead shot, but the high school coach came to me that summer and said, look, you really need to go to a basketball camp, which we had very high quality camps back then too. And, um, and of course my parents, I was the only real, nobody really was athletic in my high school or in my family. So my parents really weren't prepared for that when I said I want to go to basketball camp and we weren't real well off. So I decided I was going to take matters in my own hands and I sold Christmas cards door to door in my little hometown to earn enough money to put the deposit on the camp. And then my coach told the camp director how hard I'd work. And he allowed me to work in the lunch line to work off the remainder of it. So I had quite the beginning, quite the humble beginnings there with my basketball career. (laughs) Well, when when did you, uh, when did you sense that you had something beyond, you know, the small town, Iowa basketball, you know, experience, uh, you know, to maybe, you know, make a more of a, a either a career or certainly a, a higher level of, of, of play. Well, you know, it just wasn't even a thought process. Um, just the high school was so important to me and the going to the state tournament was so important to me. I was so focused on that. I um, just as I went through school, went through high school, I attended every basketball camp I could over the summer. After two years of working with this one camp, they when I was a uh, junior and a senior, they had me actually working in the camp for them. I would go as a player for two weeks and then I stayed the rest of the summer as a counselor. So that was kind of cool. And I, so I think it really, what it was was just establishing um, a, a, a individual work ethic, a real desire to be good. This camp um, had contests for every skill that we learned and they gave out prizes for it. And of course I wanted to win every single one of them. So that's kind of where I've learned the real competitive skill because actually when I was in high school, I had three coaches in four years of high school and we did have a winning tradition team. But when I was a junior in high school, our entire starting lineup had graduated. So as a sophomore, I started with a bunch of seniors and then they all left. So when I came back my junior year, um, there was very low expectations for us to be a winning team. And I was not going to have any part of that. My first game as a junior was on my 16th birthday. And that night I scored 63 points and we won. And that was setting the bar really high for myself. And once I set my goals and set that bar that high, there was no turning back. And uh, for, for avid listeners of this show, and we do have a Oh, a couple of thousand so far. Uh, luckily, uh, the, the birthday uh, she's referencing is actually doubly important for this conversation because you and I share a birthday, which is November 13th. So two months ahead of time. Oh. Happy, happy <laughs> birthday to you. I know that's a huge, a huge thrill for you as it is for me. Uh, but but l- l- before we go further in your in your uh, the high school stuff. Right. So uh, I think it's also really important to understand the kind of game you were playing. Right. Was not sort of the conventional basketball five aside that we kind of knew, right? I, maybe your, our audience could benefit from understanding what, what type of basketball you were playing at the high school level. Well, really, it really sounds like an old fashioned thing, but actually it was perfectly suited for small town girls, high school basketball, because, um, you know, in my class, we only had 12 girls in my entire class. So it wasn't like you had a huge selection of athletes to fill teams. So we played three on three, two dribbles, half court, the, the defense stayed on one end, the offense stayed on the other end. After you score a basket, the referees took the ball out of the net and threw it to the referee at half court. And then, then the forward at the other end would inbound the ball from center court. So it was a high pace, fast scoring game that made it so popular. I mean, the crowd loved it because, you know, my junior year, I averaged 50 points a game. My high school uh, team averaged 85. We'd score a hundred, you know, in a, in a 34 minute game or 32 minute game we played eight, uh, four, eight minute quarters. So that style of basketball is what I believe contributed so much to the success of, and the interest, the high interest levels, because 
it was so fast paced and high scoring. Uh, you didn't have the slow transition or if you didn't have the ball handlers, like if you had these little small schools, you know, of, you know, 150 kids, you're not going to have these spectacular ball handlers that are going to be able to transition the ball up down the court. So this three on three rules that they had since the beginning of time, I believe, uh, in the, in the Iowa rules anyway, uh, really contributed to a lot of the interest and excitement of the game because it was so high scoring and fast paced with the, with, there was basically no transition is the, the referees. I mean, of course, you know, let's say you shoot the forward shoots and we miss the, the, the defense would rebound and they would have two dribbles and pass it to try to get the ball across the court to the forwards at the other end. So, um, you know, and there was such thing as fast breaks. You know, I had a uh, player that would bomb the ball from one end to the other and I would take off, you know, and catch it and make a layup, you know. So there was, it still was uh, a really, really fun way to play basketball. You know, but, there's nothing like it. So, uh, but the, the transition though, as you uh, moved into college and, and there were some, obviously some, some tryouts, the Pan American games and the Olympic trials and all those kinds of things. Uh, did you find the adjustment to the more, shall we call it conventional game, a challenge or, or to your point earlier, did you find it maybe almost as a, a competitive advantage because you had grown up playing this way? Well, I think um, the six on six that I learned was definitely a competitive va- advantage. And, you know, ironically, I never really thought much about it until a fairly recent article came out that was really cool. It was comparing me to Steph Curry and that we were very unconventional, very successful in our sport, but in a very unconventional way. And that was kind of the first time I'd really thought about it, that the being limited to two dribbles um, on the offensive end really forces a player to create something, you know. And so back in the early 70s, when I first started playing, I learned how to create my shots with a quick move and a jump shot. And um, it wasn't like dribble, 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 turn your back and pass and then try to. No, you had two dribbles. And a lot of times I would do it with one and just pop up and, and, and shoot a jumper. So um, it really had a strong effect on the type of player I became. And then obviously it paid off kind of down the road when I had to transition to the new rules of five on five. Uh, the very first time I played that, interestingly, was right after I graduated from high school. I was invited to the tryouts for the uh, 1976 uh, silver medal basketball team, Olympic basketball team. Uh, but it was the Pan Am Games. It was the end of um, 1975. So they were putting the team together right then. And I got invited to the tryout. And I was really intimidated because I had never really even played full court basketball before. And But they had looked at my stats, obviously, and seen what I could score. And they were very interested. And when I pa- bypassed a lot of my camp counselors who taught me how to play basketball and make, getting selected for the finals, I was really just shocked. You know, I never really thought that I would be better than them. And then um, I made the final cut uh, before the team. And and it was so cool because they pulled me aside. I was, you know, 17 years old. And they said, look, we think you have, um, you know, a great future ahead of you. And we brought you this far so you could get the experience. And, you know, we see you being part of our future program. So that was that was a really cool thing for me, even though I got cut prior to making the team. Um, and unfortunately, so that was in, you know, for the 76 in 1980, as everyone knows, um, we boycotted the Olympics, but I had already turned pro and back then we weren't allowed to even try out. And then in 1984, um, the, my pro league had already folded. They still weren't allowing pro basketball players to play in the Olympics, not until 1988. And, um, but I was selected for an all-star team to tour with the 1984 Olympic team that eventually won the gold medal. So that was like, you know, the full experience I, or the closest I got really to, to getting to play with the Olympics was that we got to, when I toured with the 1984 team, we were working out with them at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs that summer before the 1984 Olympics. Well, so the Olympics, right? This is uh, something that will have a specter, not only, I mean, you, you've mentioned it on a personal level, but clearly, you know, the Women's Professional Basketball League as well. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, in the early days of the league, Commissioner Bill Byrne and the founder, et cetera, you know, almost counting on the fact that, you know, a 1980 uh, Olympics boost would uh, would help both uh, in the lead up, I guess, to the Olympics and 
and afterwards as players came back. But of course, all those plans went awry. Um, but maybe, though, uh, maybe that may brings us into I, I don't want to completely jump through your your college career and some of the, the, the setup to that. But, you know, as you were the first player uh, signed by the WBL and I and it seems to me that there were a number of other players that uh, would have also signed had it not been for at least at the time, uh, the Olympics uh, still as a possibility and not wanting to lose their amateur status. Did you ever have to think Absolutely. through that process? Absolutely. Um, I really didn't because, um, you know, like Ann Myers and Nancy Lieberman are two um, very good examples of top players who opted to wait for the Olympics. And um, I didn't really have that thought process myself because I was just so thrilled that the league came along. When I played for Grandview College, um, at the time it was a junior college, but they had just they were transferring into being a four-year college. And I graduated with a three-year certificate, which is kind of odd because they were in the middle of that transfer from a JC to a four-year school. So when I graduated from uh, Grandview College in 1978, um, that's the time when the pro league started. And it just so happened that the general manager for the Iowa Cornets, the first team to enter the pro league, was my former college coach, Rod Lynn. So uh, it was kind of nice to have a little in with that. So he, of course, knew all about me since he recruited me to college. Do I have this right that uh, as the first player signed by the WBL, um, this was not just a, a local thing and a, and a you know, a, a family thing for the Bowen family, but it was also kind of a statewide thing. I, I, do I have this right that they actually you did the signing ceremony in the governor's office? Yes, that was um so Rod, what he was really good at was promotions and marketing. And when he told me that a couple of things that summer, right before we played um, the first season, um, of course, Iowa was the first team in the league and he, they decided to make a big splash out of it by having me sign in governor Ray's office, which was, you know, the big press conference and all that, which was pretty cool for me, you know, to get experience that, you know, coming out of Moravia population 700 and, um, you know, it was just um, a, a great way to market it. That summer before we played um, in 1978, we my our owner, who was George Nissen, actually financed a movie, a kind of a B movie starring Pete Maravich um, that was shot in Iowa using some of us uh, on the team to also help promote the league and the team. And unfortunately, that, that movie, which started out being called dribble and ended up being called scoring uh went straight to video and but it it was it was incredibly fun and i got to be good friends with pete maravich right as he, he had just injured his knee and left the new orleans jazz and he they just moved to utah and i think right after he went back that summer of 78 i think not too long after that he uh, went to the Boston Celtics and finished his career there. So uh, let, maybe there's a good time to talk about sort of the, the Cornets, right? So, <clears throat> you know, Iowa, not necessarily known historically for, um, you know, a, a, a long and, and varied career in professional sports franchises, right? So in some respects, almost like a blessing uh, in disguise, right? Because here it is your opportunity, um, if not to stay amateur for the Olympic uh, funnel to actually play pro and frankly, stay relatively close to home. Uh, in doing so, a pretty kind of rare and uh, uh, maybe, you know, un unforeseen opportunity. It really was. And it was completely unexpected. I mean, when I played high school basketball, all I thought and focused about and worked for was to make that state tournament play high school basketball. Then um, I focused on trying to make the Olympic team that summer after high school. And then I went to play Grandview College, um, never even thinking once about ever playing pro. It never even entered my mind. It's just the opportunity happened to crop up right as I was out of school and ready to move to the next step. Now, the thing about um, Iowa, it was just a natural to put a pro team there because there was such great support in the state of Iowa for girls basketball that they figured it would be, you know, an easy step, you know, to get people to follow the pro team. So the very first year of the Iowa Cornets, they took us out and we sort of barnstormed Iowa. We played all our home games in different cities around the state. So people could get to know who we were and relate more to the team and, and follow the team and support the team because 
um, the, the statewide paper, which was the Des Moines Register, covered all our games. And of course, the Des Moines Register went out to all the towns throughout the state. All right. Well, let, let, let's get into a little bit about sort of the WBL uh, in general and, and some of the, I don't know, characters and whatnot. But maybe maybe we could start, though, uh, again, doing some research, right? Um, you know, the Cornets seem to be uh, pretty well um, funded by comparison and supported. Um, I mean, you had your own tour bus. Uh, maybe you want to explain maybe sort of that little experience. Um, I think it's called the, was the corn dog bus. Is that what it was called? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it got a little corny, pardon the pun, but a we had a customized Greyhound bus. Uh, George Nissen was probably the greatest owner in the league. At least we thought so. Um, he treated us like gold. Um, we had like a, we had like a halftime show of Polish acrobats. We had this customized bus that we traveled in. Um, you know, it was just, it was a really a great operation. Um, that first year was a lot of fun to play and we did, um, fly other places, but because most of the teams were around the Midwest, such as like Milwaukee, Chicago, um, you know, by the way, Chicago was, was a very uh, huge rival for us as well as like Minneapolis. They were also a top rival for us that first year. But, um, yeah, it was just, he was such a great owner. And, um, unfortunately, you know, after two years, um, George Nissen had investments. He, he had, um, universal, uh, equipment, the weights and trampolines that he was into. And he was doing a lot of trades with the Shah of Iran. I guess he had like some big million dollar deal going on when that whole thing went down with the hostages. I mean, I saw a movie about it a while back. Um, and it was so shocking to see how closely connected we were because that financial loss caused him to have to give up the Iowa Cornets team after two years, but we were the most successful. We were the, the ideal team in the league. We had, we were leading the league in attendance. We were getting four to 5,000 people a night. We were getting telev television, televised coverage games, which was, a great step for a brand new pro league, but uh, Bill Byrne, who was the uh, bring, you know, he was the commissioner and he was the one that came up with the idea. Um, he was quite the salesman. I mean, basically what he would do to get these teams in place is he would act like he would talk to people like it was already happening and all these people had already joined when they had not. Um, and, you know, he talked to people that they were going to lose money and they did, you know, they're, they weren't going to turn a profit these, those first few years and try to get them prepared to lose money. But obviously there were some teams, um, there was some adjustment between the first year and the second year. And there was a few teams that weren't prepared to lose, um, lose that kind of money and not see the returns come back. So they dropped out too. Well, we, we've seen that theme in some of the, uh, the leagues and teams that we've explored thus far in our uh, long and winding journey in professional, un, you know, forgotten sports things. Uh, I mean, Bill Byrne, I mean, you, 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 I think you put it uh, kind of charitably. I, there's a quote in, uh, by the way, I, I recommend our audience a book called Mad Seasons by a woman named Cara Porter. Um, it is probably the definitive uh, tome about uh, the Women's Professional uh, Basketball League of the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, some great stories. And I, we're never going to get to touch half of them in this conversation. But in there, Bill Byrne is quoted as saying, in the 50s, I was known as a hustler. In the 60s, I was a promoter. In the 70s, I was an entrepreneur. The difference, I just paid my bills in the 70s. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he completely did, but, um, you know, that, that book, The Mad Seasons, was, was a whole, you know, what she did to write that book was she put on a 25th anniversary of the, the, the WBL, the league, and brought all of us back. And, um, you know, we did, we reenacted the tip off and we had a great weekend and everything. The difference is when you're a pioneer and you're starting a new sport like that, one thing that we learned right off the bat was that you're always positive because whenever they would write stories about our league, they would call us fledgling or that we, you know, we're just struggling to survive or something like that. And um, everything we had to do was like, you know, talk about the positive you could. And that was Bill Byrne. You know, you had to say that this was going to be successful when you had no idea if it was going to be. But, you know, we were all in that mindset of making this work. We didn't have any idea what it was like to be a professional basketball player because we were the first ones to do it, but we were establishing that. You know, we were out there, you know, talking to the kid, working with the kids. We were handing out coupons in grocery stores. We were at malls. We were, you know, we were out promoting the league. Um, 
doing all kinds of, you know, especially me, I was kind of singled out to do um, personal appearances. And I mean, they had me, you know, I remember waking up one Sunday morning and the TV was on and they said I was going to be in some jello jump uh, charity fundraiser. I'm like, I am, (laughs) you know, I didn't know anything about it. So, you know, but it was, it was just that introduction to a different level at the professional level of the things that you do um, to make it financially was just, um, especially at the beginning, because there was, there was no like established formula to follow. We were the first and we were doing our best to, to make it successful because we knew our, our future depended on it. Well, it seems Byrne was on to something, right? Because uh, I think it's important to remember, you know, you're talking about the, the early and uh, the mid 1970s where, uh, there truly was some, something going on with, re- with regard to, uh, the women's basketball uh, play, right? You had Title IX, right, in 1972, which, of course, is, you know, a, a gigantic uh, move forward and, and, and enabled a whole a lot of lead. things, right? Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, you had the Battle of the Sexes tennis tournament in 73, uh, you know, and obviously a lot of sort of the, you know, the, the equality kinds of things there. The ERA obviously was winning its way through legislatures all over the country. You also had, um, and, and maybe this is somebody you uh, maybe have a memory of, uh, you know, a, a woman... Uh, like Karen Logan, right, who, you know, was right. uh, essentially, you know, barnstorming with the All-American Redheads and, you know, was part of an SI article, was on the Superstars, right? We've had, we had Kyle Roach Jr. on a, a couple episodes ago and, and you know, in the sport of soccer, that certainly helped, you know, put some spotlight onto, onto a sport that didn't get. And you also had, I think, frankly, for the first time, uh, the women's game featured on national television, right? 75, you had, you know, a couple of major college games going on. And I think even Logan... Uh, Karen Logan even played Jerry West in this sort of manufactured horse game on national television. So it seemed like the women's game right, was right. becoming more of a quote unquote thing. So it didn't stretch, you know, credulity that that maybe a pro league could be a good thing to do. Well, it's just the difference was right then you saw um, some of the other women's professional sports taking off, uh, such as uh, tennis with, you know, Chrissy Everett and and golf was starting to get um, um you know, a lot more attention, but what was really lacking was the team sports for women back then. And, you know, you have to put this in perspective in that this was prior to Jane Fonda making it popular for women to exercise and, and actually sweat. I mean, that was a, that was a big movement that didn't happen until like in the early eighties. So we were still outside of Iowa. So inside of Iowa, it was highly accepted. I mean, I could, I could, you know, wear my makeup and put ribbons in my hair and go out and kick butt playing basketball. And everybody thought it was cool. But outside of that, um, especially when you know, with the pro leagues, they were like, I would go put my check in the bank, my professional check that I just got paid. And they go basketball. They go, what do you do? I said, I'm a player. And they go, well, you don't look like a player. I said, really, what's a pro basketball player supposed to look like? Well, you're supposed to be, you know, look like a guy and be big and, you know, strong and everything. And I'm like, really? Well, I would like to invite you out to see our games and then see what you have to say after that. You know, so there was this stereotype and this um, perception, I think, um, of of just society in general that we had to overcome. And we were probably before our time just because the mentality of our society wasn't there yet. We were just a little too soon. So that was a little frustrating. Well, okay. So I will, we'll, 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 let's talk about that now. Right. Okay. So, you know, they're, they're, you know, clearly fans of the league, uh, you know, and, and people who go delve back into the history books. Right. Um, let's put it this way. And I'll try to be as, uh, as, as charitable and as, as diplomatic as possible. You were not, <laughs> you are not an unattractive player. Let's put it that way. Right. And, <laughs> and, and the league, uh, I think, and the PR folks behind, uh, certainly, um, recognize that as well and and i gotta think that while on a certain level that's got to be a heady experience and and um you know and, and all all positive and good um there is that essence of double standard right like to whom are you marketing this sport to why does the female version of this game have to uh even uh delve into things other than the quality of play on the court. I mean, all the things, it seems like a mishmash of uh, con- conflict and uh, and double standards. And I, I wonder what your thought process was as you were going through, 
being, frankly, front and center for the league and uh, and being attractively focused as such? Well, just to back it up a little bit, my my first year with the Iowa Cornets, um, we actually fired our head coach prior to our first game. And we brought in, uh, and then Rod Lynn and his assistant took over. He was our general manager. Always a good, I was, always um, a good start, right? I was the 12th of 12 players on that team. And they decided I was going to be the designated shooter. So after they did five players and, and rotated five more players, and I had to still wait to get on the court. Um, basically what happened was um, somebody got hurt. I finally got a chance to play. And that first year, like early January or February, I set the, the scoring record at 53 points. And then all of a sudden, everybody started looking at me like, oh, okay, maybe we should let her play. <laughs> so it took a while. It just like, it didn't like I just waltzed in there and instantly had success. Well, then after I set the scoring record, then there was a lot of attention put on me. And then I was asked to do like, um, you know, some of the promos for the team and that kind of stuff from that point. And there was no question they absolutely did want to project a feminine, a more feminine image because of the general perception that the public had of women athletes were not that positive back then at that time. Not necessarily in Iowa, but I'm talking league wide and, you know, which was around the United States. So I think there was obviously some kind of concentrated effort to say, hey, look, you know, um, we're not trying to be men, we're women and, you know, here we are, you know, we're trying, we, we want to play like men, but it doesn't mean we have to look like them. And I mean, that was kind of my thing. Cause I was always very competitive, but I was also a very feminine player. So no doubt they kind of latched on to that to kind of overcome some of the negative stereotypes. Um, and then it didn't help really a whole lot. The second year I played with the Iowa Cornets, um, they didn't offer me much of a raise and, um, so I came up with the idea of selling posters, which were very popular at the time back in the Farrah Fawcett days. And when we did the post and I, it was totally my control. When we did the posters, I was able to make the, the, the income from the sales of the posters. And, um, and so that kind of is what started this whole marketing versus exploitation. You know, is it too sexist? And I was like, you know what, I'm just doing my thing. You know, I'm doing what I enjoy doing this is who I am. I'm not trying to be anybody else. So just take it or leave it. But what happened was the league took my posters and they, they were in demand all across the league. Everybody wanted to buy them, you know, from other teams as well. So, um, we were kind of onto something there, but it wasn't necessarily the way everybody else wanted us to be perceived. So it did get a little out of hand that way, but they, nothing was out of, you know, you know, it wasn't in bad taste or anything whatsoever. It's just that. And, and then you, even now looking back, there is still, I have very few action shots of myself playing basketball, you know, during the pro league. I mean, now look how many pictures they take of these athletes. You know, they're everywhere. But most of the pictures I had were all promo shots off the court. So that's one of the reasons probably why there there was more of a focus on that was because there just wasn't a, a, enough of the action shots to, to take the place of the promo ones. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seats Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you can think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to, and Audible's got it. 
by the way, two, uh, two guests perhaps that we'll have on the show hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30 day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. Well, a couple of things that are interesting there. I think first and foremost, and probably most importantly, is that, you know, and I, you, you, you were a quality player before these sort of other opportunities and, and, and PR sort of uh, uh, halo uh, things uh, were there, right? Because in, in eight, you know, your first season, I mean, you lit up the league, right? You led the entire league in scoring and you led the team to the final that went five games and, and ultimately they lost the last game. I mean, yeah, we went to the championship two years in a row. The first year um, I was kind of a, a slow coming on because of getting the playing time on the court. I did make the all-star team and I finished, um, you know, the season uh, about 17 points a game. The second year we had a new coach come in. He uh, set the offense around me where I was going to get 30, 35 uh, points a game just from all the shots that I was getting. And it, 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 then the focus was really on there. Um, it was kind of strange because then, you know, it was the point where I would go shopping and I'd have people like sneaking around following me through stores, <laughs> little kids or adults, you know, that were on an autograph or something. So that, that was kind of the start of that one. The second year when uh, the coach decided that he was going to run an offense where I was going to get, you know, I was the shooting guard and I was going to get the shots because he had everything sort of, you know, planned that the, that the one who's the point guard is going to handle the ball up, you know, down the court. Cause he, it was his, this coach's thought process is that the more he could structure our running game and control our offense, the less turnovers we'd have, the more productive we'd be. It just so happened that he put me in the role to score a lot. And he was, he went out of his way to make sure that I never felt favored or that I had a big head or anything. Cause he was really, really hard on me the second year when I was the scoring league scoring champ, he was very, very tough on me that year. You picked up a nickname, uh, favorably, uh, in the process too. Uh, any recollection of, of how you got that nickname machine? Well, it was, um, it was an AP writer. I believe that, um, the, the legend has is from the Washington Post who did it, but um, it came out in one of the articles describing me as as Machine Gun Molly. And then, of course, everybody from the marketing department jumped all over it. And I remember going into my office going, wait a minute, you know, I don't want to be that. I don't want that to be my name. They're going, hey, you got to shut up and go with it because this is a good thing. And I'm like, how is it a good thing? You know, it's not something I like. And they're like, too bad. It's too late. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, you know, it was just something that stuck. Yeah. And I think that's that that's that that really is an important sort of thing to recognize, too, because, you know, in 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 Hollywood, right, they say no, no publicity is bad publicity. Right. Which, you know, obviously is a mm-hmm. it's a heavy laden thing. But, um, you know, you're you're in a young uh, uh, I hate to use the word again, fledgling, you know, league that's uh, looking for, you know, quote unquote exposure. Right. And, you know, you don't want to necessarily. Uh, do things that were untoward or or whatever, right? But you know, no, the idea of gaining attention uh, and hopefully convincing a few people who might not have paid attention to it otherwise to come to a game, maybe come back to a game, right, buy some right. tickets, etc. Um, you kind of got to pull out all the stops, so to speak. And 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 I think you know you, you were sort of at the right time and right place to kind of be one of those star attractions. Right. And the, the third season, um, okay, so this is what happened. After the end of the second season, George Nissen lost his money. He tried to sell the team to a, a another a backup owner. That guy turned out to be a crook. And uh, by the time they figured out that he wasn't who he said he was and he wasn't paying the bills, um, the team went down. So we got dispersed out to a draft. But at the same time, another league had tried to uh, spring up taking advantage of some of the mistakes that the WBL made, which was the fact that they played in large arenas. Like I played the Madison square garden, you know, and large arenas like that, that held a lot of people that cost money. So this new league was formed on, uh, started on playing in smaller arenas, being more regional. They felt that we kept the expenses down, we could make it. So they, after the Cornets folded, they heavily recruited me out to Southern California. 
So when I came out to Southern California, of course, the first thing they wanted to do is take some bathing suit pictures and, you know, all that kind of stuff when I got to Southern California. Well, that league only lasted about two or three months. So by December of 1980, you know, they decided, you know, they figured out it wasn't going to make it because some of the owners uh, dropped out before the league could get going. So then there was um, then there was a big grab for us players that were from the WBL to go back to the WBL for the third season, and I ended up in San Francisco. So I got recruited at San, San Francisco Pioneers, very apropos name. And um, what was kind of cool about that was that they were doing some major, you know, changes on the team, and they brought in six of my Iowa Cornet teammates to play with me, and. They brought in Dean Memager as the coach who had won the championship with New York the previous year. Sure. So I ended up going to San Francisco. So one of the games, not too long after I got there, um, and I, you know, I was married to my first husband at the time, and I remember um, he walked in and slammed a paper on the bed. He goes, what the hell's this? And I looked at it, and it, they used a swimsuit picture. It was on the cover of the sports page. I was like, oh, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> you know, I didn't know... I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't know they were going to use it. And next thing you know, we had like 6,000 people at the game that night wanted me to sign this, this newspaper. I mean, they, they definitely used a swimsuit photo to shock people into paying attention and the coming to our game. So that, and that was done without my knowledge. But, um, you know, the thing was, is that it just, you know, I was so focused on just playing and uh, being successful. I mean, I didn't let that stuff bother me because, you know, there was enough of the challenges uh, going on without having to, to worry about that kind of stuff. Well, and, 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 and playing, I mean, you were, you were, you were an amazing player, right? I mean, like the year before in 79, 80, I mean, you had, I think it was like 11 or 12 separate records and, and, and correct me on this, right? So, I keep reading articles and whatnot, and they, they refer to you as having scored the most points in the game. Um, what I think I figured out is that you did it three times in that season, one for 53 points in 79, one for 54 in the early part of 1980, and then a little later in the season in March of 80, you scored and beat your own record again at 55. Do I have that right? Yes, except the 53 was my first year when I had the breakout game when they weren't letting me play. Got it. So that was the first year. And then the second year, we had a televised game that it's on the Internet um, for the 54 points. So that was kind of cool having, you know, a game that was televised. However, I can I can honestly say, you know, having a full gym, having um, or, or a, a large crowd, having uh, television cameras, that put me into a different level and focus and and you know, trying my hardest to play. Plus we were playing a number one rival for first place. So, you know, I think that had a lot to do with um, setting the scoring record uh, at 54. Then the one for uh, 55 points happened later in the second season. And it just so happened that I um, dislocated my shoulder in the second quarter and I thought I was done for the, the game. And then they, you know, managed to get it popped back in and I went back to the game. So that was something I don't think I could uh, have repeated after that because nowadays they don't even let you play hurt, you know, let alone go back in and do a record. And then um, during the playoffs, I scored 50 points in playoffs, which was a playoff record. So, um, you know, it was for me, it was more like I set the bar pretty high for myself. And then that was what my expectation was. Uh, I, I can't let the conversation go without your uh, general assessment of the league itself, the players that you played with, um, maybe even to the point of, of asking, you know, was there even any jealousy, perhaps, because you were certainly a, uh, a standout, not only star on the court, but obviously a marketing vehicle uh, and superstar of sorts off the court. Uh, I'm I'm curious as sort of days in the life and and maybe how you fit into that. Were you just, you know, essentially one of the players or was a little jealousy maybe thrown your way along the way? No, you know, with the Iowa team, it was pretty amazing because we were we really bonded. We went, you know, we were all struggling trying to make this work. Um, you know, we were all good friends. And of course, I didn't start out as a superstar. I clawed my way up there. But um, even in the second year when I started scoring, you know, it just you know, part of it is just my personality is that, you know, I looked at it as that's my job. You know, that's how we're going to win and that's what I'm going to do. And it, and it became kind of a, <laughs> it became kind of a joke really with the girls because, you know, we were good friends. So for instance, we're in the, in the bus going down the road 
and um, uh, we're in one of the towns close to where my hometown was, and a car pulls alongside our bus and starts honking, and they go, put Molly in the window! And of course, my teammates are more than happy to oblige and shove me over to the window, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I didn't get, you know, I didn't get any slack at all. So there was, there was definitely um, a lot of fun that we had and we had each other's backs. Um, I don't think there was um, a lot of ego, especially our coach the second year when I was going to get all the shots and all the attention and he knew it, he treated me like I was like, you know, the lowest person on the team, which kind of sucked for me because I was always struggling, even with my confidence then. But, you know, it just really eliminated what he was trying to do is make sure that everybody knew there was no favoritism. It was my role in the team. You know, everybody had their role. Everybody knew what it was. Um, it was just, it was a business, you know, and that's kind of how we went about it. Now, things changed. Um, when I went to San Francisco, there was a little problem. Um, they didn't want to pass me the ball when I first got there because they were, you know, moving players around and everything. And they actually shipped a couple of girls out that, that wouldn't bring, you know, wouldn't accept me on the team and they sent them somewhere else. But, um, in 1984, okay. So the league, the WBL folded in 1981, um, just a real struggle of trying to bring teams in teams going out, you know, trying to stabilize it. There was some fighting going on. If you read mean seasons at the top with the management, but in 1984, Bill Byrne tried to put it together again to capitalize on the 1984 gold medal Olympic team. And so he formed a team called the WABA, which um, the home office was in Columbus, Ohio. And of course, whenever at that point, whenever he was going to start a league, he'd call me up. Molly, you got to be there. I'm starting a league. You got to help me. I mean, he looked at me as like, I'm going to come out and promote it and do the interviews and press conferences and all that kind of stuff and give him instant credibility, you know, with my background. That's kind of how they looked at me back then. Columbus, Ohio was a different experience because when I showed up there, it was, you know, three years later, because 1981 was my last season with the WBL. And three years later, um, it was a very hostile environment. Things had changed. The girls had had, you know, had played in college where they had, uh, very good budgets. They were treated a lot better. They traveled with trainers and all the stuff that we really didn't get those first couple of years. And um, when things got rough, they complained a lot. And I was the one going, hey, you guys don't have any idea. You know, this is, this is good. You know, and I think they wanted me on the team for that, but it was, it was such a struggle in 1984 to play on that team. And, you know, it only lasted that one season, unfortunately. But the best thing about that one was the summer before that league started was I was brought back to Boston to be in a Spalding commercial and uh, with Larry Bird. So I got a chance to play one-on-one -on -one with Larry Bird and had marketing pictures taken with them. So that was, that was kind of a highlight of the whole experience, I think, in 1984. Why do you think the uh, the WABA uh, didn't make it, given the uh, the halo of the the Olympic uh, victory? Well, I think you know what they always used to say about Bill, Bill Byrne was his um, his dreams always exceeded his talents. So he would go out and he would get people to say they were going to do stuff, and when it came right down to it, only half of the people performed, or even less. So if he thought he was going to have a league of eight, only four of them actually stepped up and put their money in, even though he told everybody that they were all in. So that was a big part of it in that um, a lot of the commitments that people made, they didn't follow up with it to keep it afloat. But, you know, looking back at the 1984 Olympic team, we had, you know, of course, a gold medal team, but... Uh, I remember because I knew all the girls because we traveled together and played exhibition games together. And one of the games we played in was in the world's largest indoor basketball game held in Indianapolis, uh, Hoosier Dome. And we played uh, against NBA in the men. We played double hitters with the men's Olympic team and the NBA All-Stars. So that's why there were so many people in that gym. So they had the women and the men's Olympic team double hitters. It was really a cool thing to be a part of. But, um, you know, it just really didn't springboard like we thought it would because here I know all these players on the Olympic team and I was trying to watch them play in the Olympics. But the, the TV coverage uh, then was like they would, they would play, you know, five minutes of the game. You'd see on TV, and, but you never knew when it was going to be played. You couldn't ever predict you'd have to have the Olympics on all day long if you wanted to catch the girls' basketball team play. 
I mean, and that's changed over the years, but uh, then they would just show clips of it here and there. They never got the full, unless they were in a championship game, they would maybe cover the entire game, but the coverage really wasn't that good, um, you know, to promote the women's basketball like we had hoped it would be. Well, it also speaks, I think, to the uh, the bane of many fledgling leagues, especially in the 70s uh, or so, uh, with the lack of television coverage. And I think it's important, you know, uh, a bunch of our listeners don't necessarily remember, uh, uh, you know, those back in those days, there weren't a whole lot of, you know, choices, right? You had a couple of independent stations and some network affiliates, and that was pretty much it when it came to television. This was before the advent of right. cable networks and all that. So I, you, you wonder what it would have been like had there been a robust, say, cable television ecosystem, right, with maybe some, and, and it seemed to me that in all the things that I've read, that, that Byrne was clearly always on the lookout for, and the commissioner that followed him, I guess maybe even more so, trying to get some kind of television deal for the league to get that exposure on a, on a regular basis. No question, Bill went after that right from the start, and I think Iowa was the only team that had regional uh, television coverage for most of our home games. Um, so the Iowa team had, we had that right from the, the start, but, um, I remember him talking about that all the time. Um, you know, the, 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 how important the TV coverage was, um, even when I had gone into some sports broadcasting in college and, and that's what I'd kind of hoped to do at some point, um, there just weren't hardly any opportunities. And when there was the, when the opportunities did come up to do, some kind of color commentary for, for women's basketball, you know, it was Ann Myers or Lieberman. That's the only ones they wanted because when the pro league went down, it was, it was a weird thing because when the pro league in 1981, when it folded, it was like uh, the college game had just started to, to come on the rise, you know, with the final fours and the, the, the women's basketball coaches association was a very strong organization but when the women's pro league folded, they didn't want any association with that. They wanted to complete because they were trying to be successful on their own. And just all that money had started coming into the college programs because I started working for a company and I attended those final fours working in the um, exhibit booth area, promoting uh, different tools, uh, you know, to, to promote, you know, shooting or whatever. It was different companies I worked for, but I was always there at those final fours. So it was interesting that they, you know, were there to buy stuff, but they weren't, they wanted to distance themselves from a failed pro league. They, they definitely did. But, you know, one, one interesting thing too, is that um, the smaller women's basketball started with us um, the very first year when Wilson, when they selected Wilson to be our supplier for our, our pro league basketballs, um, they invented, they made the ball an inch smaller and that first ball had a little wider threads on it too, because they figured that um, it should be adjusted to the size of the women's hands or whatever. They even talked about lowering the hoops, which that never happened. They kept the basketball, which I'm glad, you know, because I think that really compromises the game to start messing with the height of the, the basket. You know, that's, that's kind of sacred. That shouldn't have been touched, but they did make the ball um, an inch smaller. And I think it did help a lot with our ball handling, especially for me, you know, who became a long distance shooter. Um, you know, I was able to to get more grip on the ball, that sort of thing. So that was one thing we did um, was the first was we were the first to start was the, the smaller basketball for the women's game. Well, it was controversial a bit at the time. Right. And, um, you know, maybe part of also the, the implied or or. or uh, uh, you know, uh, latent sexism, I guess, right? Uh, the idea of, uh, of why there has to be a smaller ball. But the simple fact is that, you know, women's hands tend to be generally smaller than the average males. And, you know, why would you want to, why would you burden the sport with it, with a ball that doesn't sort of uh, take that into account? Well, I don't know if it was a promotional thing or, or even you know, how, that, I don't yeah. know the whole story behind that. But um, I do think it was a good idea because in every, um, sport that has both women and men competing, there's some kind of adjustment in the game, you know, to make it um, more competitive, a better spectator sport. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, to make it, um, you know, a better marketability, you know, to enjoy watching it, you know, and I think it, it did enhance it a little bit. I mean, it wasn't that big of a difference. I mean, I switched back and forth between the bigger and the smaller ball, like when I would do basketball camps, because I started doing shooting clinics all the time, you know, because I had done them from high school all the way through 
college and pros, I always worked uh, basketball camps. And there was a lot of times that I used a larger ball and, you know, just mentally I would, you know, I would still shoot the same. I just wouldn't shoot as far back. All right. You, you've been great with, uh, with your time so far. I just, I've got two sort of two more questions and, and I'll, I'll let you get back to your, uh, to your life. Um, and I can't thank you enough for, for regaling sure. me so far. Um, you know, in 82, right, you know, it was a tough year for you, right? You had, um, you know, the, the whole divorce uh, uh, and the custody issues and the double mm-hmm. standards and, and the whole, you know, the the idea of a, your career being used against you, um, ironically, um, you know, any any things that sort of uh, come out of that or came out of that experience? I mean, uh, as I frankly, I think a lot of that adds to your pioneer status, not just as your, as a basketball player. <laughs> well, uh, there's, there's no doubt when you're the first and you're the pioneer and you're, you're paving the way for the future, there's no doubt you go through those bumps in the road. And, and part of that was, was redefining um, the roles that you're playing as, um, as a parent, you know, as, as an adult, I mean, we were paving new ground that, you know, my, my family, my family, but my husband's family, I uh, was very upset when I signed my first pro contract and I was looking at him like, Hey, this was not even a considerate, you know, I wouldn't even consider not doing it. I mean, it was for me, I would have walked through fire to sign that contract. You know, there was no way anybody was going to stop me from doing that. But, um, it, there was definitely a, an issue, um, you know, because when the focus got put on me, my husband then was a bricklayer. He got laid off in the winter time. So I'm supporting the family, um, he felt like people were looking down at him for that. Um, there was, there was issues through this whole thing as we tried to define our roles in our marriage and, you know, all that kind of, then I got all the attention and I got invited to do everything. He couldn't understand why I had to be the one to be gone all the time. You know, I should be home, you know, that sort of thing. So we were going through all that. And then when, um, it came down to the custody battle, um, yeah, I mean, it, but it was, I kind of got railroaded. Um, I found out later that the, the judge and um, my ex's attorney were fishing buddies. And so they went through this sham of a court case and made me fly back there three times for this court case and then ruled against me. And fortunately, my lawyer was um, had been involved with the Iowa Civil Rights uh, Union. And she said, no, this isn't going to happen. We're going to appeal it. And of course, you know, I, I was just working on a, you know, practically minimum wage trying to, to get through this. And um, she made it happen. And we won um, not only the Supreme Court, but it, it was a precedent setting case that went to the law books and that judges were no longer and dissolution of marriages were no longer to allow a divorce without designating physical custody because I had asked for joint custody, but they never said who got physical custody. So that's what happened with the, um, the whole custody battle was that the physical custody had never been decided at the time of the divorce. So it went down and, you know, as, as a president said in case. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, that was part of it. But again, you know, I look back on it. Every, everybody that played, I think in that league had different experiences. And for me, I like to look at it as a very positive thing because we made a difference. We did pave the ground for a future for women's pro basketball. I mean, there's, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a clip on me on um, the internet where I'm doing a press conference going, I believe in the future of women's pro basketball in the United States. We don't have to go overseas to get to play professionally. That's not right. You know, we're good enough and we should have a pro league right here in the United States. I mean, I was saying that back in way before the, the WNBA. But what was interesting is I've been involved with um, the attempted development of five different women's pro leagues prior to the WNBA. And I was always involved and Bill Byrne, bless his heart, would always call me, Molly, they're going to do a pro league. I'm like, oh, Bill, not again. You know, I wanted you to go meet with the owner of the Seattle Supersonics because I think he's going to be a key player for us. You know, so, I mean, I was going through that all the time. So the, the really hard thing for me was that when um, the WNBA, before they made the announcement, um, I was working with, um, I'd worked two years with um, the president of Liberty Sports, which later was bought out by Fox Sports. That was the very beginning of Fox Sports. And Liberty Sports ran kind of a semi-women's pro league. And I was flying out to Dallas to meet with them and setting up 
the beginnings of a new women's pro basketball league just prior when the WNBA made their announcement that the NBA was going to get involved. They stepped back and said, no, we're not going to compete with them. But I was very involved with every attempt to start a women's pro league clear up. And that was in 1996 when the WNBA made the announcement. The ironic part of it all was here I am, you know, the first person to step up, flew on my own expense to do press conferences, never got reimbursed for it, always battling, giving, you know, talking to the cameras about the future of women's pro basketball. When the WNBA started, nobody offered me a job. And I wrote a letter to, it was uh, the president at the time was Val Ackerman and said, look, you know, I just want to be involved. I've battled to to have this happen for so long and now it's finally going to make it. And they just ignored me. And I really don't know why. And I, and that's, that's sort of my sort of last sort of set of, of questions is, is, is that legacy, right? So it's interesting that you say that because you'd have to think, and, and, and you tell me, has the WNBA even gone out of their way to recognize the predecessor league that was the WBL uh, the people that were involved in it, obviously some are still, you know, somehow involved in the game, but, but it doesn't right. seem like there is a, I don't know, a warm embrace of what came before the WNBA. No, there wasn't. There was And again, it was that not being association associated with something that failed. Maybe that's what I thought, but um, several of the key players, obviously, um, and Myers was involved. Lieberman's there, Carol Blaschowski, uh, some of my people that were my peers, that I feel that I proved myself, at least they're equal at that time. Um, you know, they moved on to, to careers with that. And, um, you know, I was the, the co-MVP with Annie Myers the second year. Um, I was right in the scoring battle with Carol Blaszczowski, who was supposed to be the greatest shooter of all time. You know, I mean, I, I've had experiences with Nancy Lieberman over the years, too. I mean, they know very, very well who I am. <laughs> but, again, you know... I can say this, when they had the 10th year anniversary for the WNBA, the president at the time was um, Donna, her name was Donna Giles, I'm trying to think what her married name was, Donna Olander, uh, was the president of the WNBA for their 10th year anniversary. And I was invited back as a special guest for the 10th year anniversary. And I did attend all the, um, you know, all the events and all that kind of stuff, went to the games and all that stuff. And um, that was about the only time there have been some things that they've posted online, like they interviewed me and posted it on their website, um, a few things like that. But as far as I know, there's never been any kind of official recognition of any scoring records. The fact that I played with a league that, that failed, um, I think, or maybe it's the whole sexism marketing thing may have played against me with any consideration for the um, women's basketball hall of fame. Um, I actually met with Bill Wall, who was the, he was one of the executive directors with the women's basketball hall of fame. He was also president of the ABA USA way in the glory days of the Olympics at the beginning of the Olympics women's and basketball team. He met with me personally in 2013 and said, you need to be in the women's hall of fame and I'm going to make sure you get there. And he took all my information and then had the gall to pass away. <laughs> About eight months later, it was very, very sad. So I don't know what's happened since then, but since 2013, four years have passed, and I've never heard a word. So who knows? Um, I can only just guess. Um, I I know it takes a lot more than just um, a short career to be considered. And no, I did not play overseas in in Italy because I was involved in a custody battle when I first I got my offers to play in um, in European pro leagues. And I wasn't about to leave my son. So that didn't happen. And, you know, it was, it was in relatively speaking, a very short career for me. Well, I, I don't want to end on that because I, I, I do believe, right? And frankly, this is partially why we were doing this show. Um, it's not only just to remember some of the teams. And frankly, it's just also just a perverse curiosity as to what, you know, <laughs> where these teams and leagues and people and, and all that kind of stuff, because there's tremendous stories there. And you know, I, I put this out to our listeners, and 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 I am I'm shocked by uh, some of the uh, senior folks in sports that are starting to pick up on this show for whatever reason. If there is anybody right that deserves to be in any sports hall of fame 
around the sport of women's basketball. It has to be somebody like Molly Kasmer, nay Bolin, right? In that, you know, you are truly in all senses of the word and for actually a year, actually a pioneer, right? And I'm not trying, I'm trying, yeah. I'm trying to blow smoke here, but, you know, these were, uh, this was a, a, a far different era. There was no such thing really as a pro game for women. Um, and, you know, you really cut your teeth uh, with your uh, your colleagues and, and your managers and, and your your owners into something completely uncharted that is today, arguably, uh, perhaps taken for granted um, and is, is at yeah. a hi- much higher yeah. level. And, and on the backs of pioneers, you know, comes that kind of success. So it it, it strikes me as a uh, dispassionate observer that people like you should be not only remembered, but uh, celebrated uh, uh, it, for your efforts and and. Again, on the backs of pioneers come, you know, the success that, you know, a, a, a women's professional league that's gone on now for almost 20 years. Right. Right. And, you know, I, I, I can't say that that really hasn't been. I haven't gotten those particular type of recognitions, but my hometown has done amazing things. You know, like I'm on a mural on the bank wall and, and, and they made a book on me that's in all the libraries. You know, I go back to my hometown, a hero, which is there's nothing better than that. I'm in my college Hall of Fame, and I'm in the state of Iowa Hall of Fame, which I believe I'm probably the only player that never made it to the state tournament that got inducted into that Hall of Fame. So I've had, I've definitely had my my glory moments, and um, and it's definitely was worth it. And if I had it to do all over again, I would because it was the most amazing time in my life. And I think, you know, there's a reason people come along at different stages because it took somebody that had a work ethic, somebody that was unselfish, somebody willing to put the league ahead of their own personal interests to be able to do that. And I don't, I don't think people are like that anymore, you know, and that's kind of what was required when you start something new and um, everything's not going to be, you know, real easy and exactly what you expect it to be. You know, a lot of people would quit or walk away or, and people did, you know, when the going got tough, they quit, you know, and I fought harder because I did believe in the future of it. And I did, I think all of us kind of caught on to that, that there's something greater than us here. You know, this is a, a future sport that we should have the opportunity to play this. And so I do feel very lucky that I came along when I did. Um, there's a lot of players that missed it altogether that never got the opportunity at all. I mean, obviously it would have been cool to get a play, you know, like in the WNBA and go through all that because that's what I visualized. That's what... I saw that we would be, and we did. We didn't get that opportunity in that generation. But like you said, it it started it, and it, it you know it, we were breaking into the whole society um, the way they look. You know, women's sports. We had to overcome all of that. You know, and our the roles that we were expected to play. Um, you know, especially outside of college and. And there was just a, a lot of things involved with it. Um, I mean, I have to laugh now. I look at, you know, some of the WNBA players and even some of the professional soccer players. They're all posing nude and everybody thinks it's cool. You know, it's not sexism at all. I mean, my gosh, I, I posed in a tank top and shorts and people freaked. <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, times have changed, you know. But um, it really was um, – just a a great period of time. I have, you know, made some great friendships. Um, We had some incredible stories, including, you know, in the championship game, getting rained out in Houston of all places. We had, after the all-star game in New York, we had emergency plane landing and had to fly through New York city in a helicopter from, from one airport to the other one to catch another flight. I mean, it was, it was definitely, um, definitely an experience. I think that's shaped uh, my whole life. And, you know, I'm really, really glad that I had that opportunity. And I look at it as a very positive thing. That's one problem I kind of had with the whole book of the Mean Seasons is because what she didn't capture in that book was the pioneering spirit of the women that were fighting to make this happen. You know, she showed a lot of the crazy stuff going on in the management level. We didn't care. We loved this game and we played for the love of the sport and we were doing our damnedest to make it successful. That's what really mattered. Well, Molly, I, I hope this is the first of, of, of uh, many conversations that uh, we have around, uh, you know, the early days of women's professional basketball, the league itself. Uh, at some point, I'd love to have you back, uh, maybe to even go deeper in some of these wacky stories. Oh, hell, sure. That'd hell, be fun. I, I'd, I'd even, you know, I'd even like at some point, I mean, we have grand ambitions for this podcast in the 
in the months to come. But, uh, you know, I'd love to do more of these in person and maybe even a, a conversation with a, with a handful of players to kind of just, you know, recollect and, oh, and that of, would be that would be cool yeah that would and, definitely be cool and, and you know we we did um go through a lot together yeah and and also too i th- this whole notion of of uh, uh remembering uh the players that brought uh, the sport to where it is today i think is uh it's important um I, i've seen it in soccer i see it but i see it in all these sports and and it's a theme that continues to come up in our in our conversations as we go deeper uh it's something i frankly didn't expect but it's uh it, it is uh, it is important, and, and frankly, I, I, you know, you've been tremendous in, uh, in, in, in your, uh, your recollections. And and look, if if for anything, you should be in the women's basketball hall of fame simply because I think you may have had more uh, nicknames than any other player in uh, professional basketball <laughs> history. Well, you know what? Being the, I'm very proud. I mean, Rod picked me to be the first player signed because of the recognition I already had in the state of Iowa, but. And I didn't even realize it at the time, but we were the first league, the first team in the league, and I was the first player in the league. And that really didn't come out until down the road a little bit. And I didn't realize how cool that was until all these years have gone past. I mean, I don't even have a lot of my memorabilia, um, you know, from those days, although my mom collected stuff religiously. So I, I have like original tickets from the first game, you know, stuff like that. But you know, it was just, I think it was the right time to get it started because it really did take that long for it to, to catch on. And, um, you know, of, of just having that opportunity to be the first is, um, I think is a real honor. And I've always tried to influence kids and players that came past me. Um, my husband and I actually ran a middle school program working with middle school kids based on character development of sports. Uh, the class program was character, loyalty, attitude, self-respect, and sportsmanship. And that's, you know, that was, it's the old school. And that's what really means something. And I think there's a lot of that being lost now with sports is, is the character development and how important it is, especially at the younger levels and, um, you know, and how it impacts you for the rest of your life. And, uh, you know, I just had been in the, the situation where I have been able to to influence and impact younger people, even in my high school and the people that have looked up to me, you know, that came afterwards, um, you know, is, is definitely been very gratifying for that. Well, Moravia Molly, the blonde bomber, Iowa's girlfriend, machine gun <laughs> Molly Kasmer. Thank you. you. You have been absolutely a joy to talk to. And um, I, I, I look forward to staying in touch. And uh, I, I, I do mean it when, uh, hopefully we can figure out another way to, uh, another time to chat and, uh, either in a group setting or another conversation. Uh, and, uh that would be fantastic. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously the only time I ever talked about this anymore is when somebody asks me questions like yourself. So it's really fun to, to kind of reminisce because as you get older, you do have a different perspective on things, I think. But, um, what's really cool now too, is just the internet. I mean, there's stuff on there. There's websites like front fun while um, some of my, my game footage is on there. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot more history preserved through the internet, um, you know, than, than what people realize. And all it takes is just a little bit of searching and all that stuff pops up. So it's, it's really cool to have it preserved, um, at least that way, you know, because I do get remembered and I do, um, you know, I, I do talk, get the opportunity to talk about it every now and then. So they, people haven't forgotten me completely. So I really do appreciate um, the contact. All right, there it is. There's our chat with uh, Molly Kasmer. Um, delightful uh, conversation, and I very much look forward to having Molly uh, back on the show uh, at some point soon. Uh, I think we only just scratched the surface of some of the stories and uh, and interesting little tidbits that uh, uh, emanated from the old WBL in the late '70s and early '80s. And um, you know, there's just a whole host of uh, of things I'd, I want to go deeper uh, into. Uh, not only with her, but hopefully other folks. Um, you know, we mentioned a few of them. I mean, Nancy Lieberman, uh, Ann Myers, uh, Mary Jo Pepler, uh, who we alluded to in a previous episode on the uh, International Volleyball Association. Uh, she also played in the WBL, which is uh, interesting in its own in its own right. We uh, referenced um, a book that uh, I hope to get the author of as well. Uh, the book is called Mad Seasons, the story of the first women's professional basketball league. Uh, it is by a woman by the name of Kara Porter. Uh, I believe it is published by 
uh, the University of Nebraska Press, and I think the imprint is Bison Books, uh, and um, it's from which uh, this uh, pursuit of Molly uh, sort of began. And uh, again, I hope we uh, can unearth a few more fun facts and and remembrances of the old WBL and and other uh, attempts at women's professional basketball uh, prior to what exists today quite uh, steadily in today's WNBA. Let us see here uh, as we move on to more episodes. We've got a lot more fun uh, stuff coming your way. We appreciate your suggestions. Uh, We at some point will shout out uh, all of those suggestions and those people who have been kind enough to send us emails and and social media tweets and stuff. Uh, We just uh, overwhelmed by them. And I just uh, at some point need to uh, collate all of them and sort of uh, uh, give you a proper uh, recognition for doing so. But we do uh, make no mistake. We uh, we love your comments. We love your uh, your enthusiasm for the show. It's frankly overwhelming. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm I'm glad we're uh, we're hitting a nerve or uh, touching on something that uh, is at least uh, somewhat enjoyable or interesting for an hour of your week uh, each and every week. Uh, we want to thank our friends at Podfly Productions. Uh, that's Jerry Payne and Eric Begay and Corey Coates and David Gregerson. Podfly Productions. If you want to uh, get your own podcast up and running, uh, if you need professional podcast help, uh, it's Podfly Productions. They are the people that can help you best. It's podfly.net. Uh, and uh, what else? Let's see. Social media. We find us on social media at uh, on Twitter. You'll find us at Good Seats Still on uh, Instagram. You will find us at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you will find a Facebook page devoted to us. And if none of this uh, is uh, something that you can remember, just remember one thing and one thing only. And that's our vaunted website. And that is Good Seats Still Available dot com. You'll find all the old episodes. You'll find links to all the books and things that we reference here on the show. And it's also the place where you can find out where all those social media places are, where you can download the show, where you can rate and review it, uh, where you can send us email, all that stuff. That's good seats, still available.com. I'm done. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And we'll talk to you hopefully next week. Take care. Take care.